Um, it's going to be a long panel if, if uh, these guys don't show up. So <laughs> I am a, a Seattle area angel investor. I primarily focus on platforms, which in this day and age really means cloud. So we've got three local venture capitalists who are going to, we're going to talk to you about where the cloud is today and uh, how they're investing in it. Um, because I'm the moderator, we're going to reverse the usual routine of the VCs toying with the angels, and today the angel gets to toy with the VCs. So some, some quick introductions. Frank Artali is the managing partner at Ignition here in Bellevue. Um, he's been in software for more years than we want to count. Um, worked on products like Windows NT and the Zen Hypervisor at, at Microsoft and Citrix. Also done a bunch of startup stuff done pretty much every job from sales to development to CEO to, I don't know if you were ever an accountant, but uh, you've got it, got it pretty well covered. Done a bunch of investments. Frank of our, of our panelists here probably was the most active in the early days of the cloud. So it'll be interesting to hear from him. And he wants it noted that he still codes for fun and loves the new conversational UX, bots, cloud computing, and data-enabled businesses. Sheila is the founder and managing director of Tola Capital, which is a Seattle venture firm focused on the ongoing revolution in enterprise software. Previously, she spent over a decade at Microsoft, so you'll start to notice a pattern there. Um, <laughs> held a variety of business and marketing roles working on the enterprise business, and also did some corporate strategy and, and M&A. Prior to that, she was an investment banker, but we've agreed not to hold that against her too much. <laughs> Lastly, we have Soma. Soma sort of is the only VC who goes by one name that I know of. <laughs> He's sort of like a rock star or a, or a Brazilian soccer star. Um, feel free to break out in song at, at, at any time. Um, he also was at Microsoft for a very long time, but now is a managing director at the Madrona Venture Group in Seattle, focusing on AI, machine learning, developer platforms, VR and AR. So with that, since our topic is cloud, why don't we start and just kind of get people's perspectives on how you handicap the cloud race. Does Amazon run away with it? Can Microsoft, Google, anybody else catch up? Um, what are each of the big clouds doing? How do they differentiate themselves? Maybe Frank, you want to sure, start? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll start by saying that uh, you know, we're in a situation now where cloud computing is moving from being a technical curiosity to being trusted infrastructure. You know, we're seeing real business workloads uh, being deployed or being moved, uh, more or less, you know, to all forms of clouds. And not just the big three, uh, as Charles said here. We have, of course, we're here in Cloud City where we have uh, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google with heavy footprints. But there are also lots of other clouds, specialized clouds as well, that we're seeing workloads move to. But just like to really think through um, you know, who's going to be a winner, and I think you can realistically say this is a very, a very big market. And so you like to say all. There's going to be a place that, that folks choose to run different kinds of workloads for, you know, for different, different reasons. And you know, if, you talk to, if you talk to folks that, have, you know, that are deploying things to, to Google Cloud versus AWS versus Azure, or, or vice versa, every one of those will have, have a reason. And so if folks want you'd like sort of the, maybe the, the ultimate in, um, uh, of a cloud that is very specialized for something like, like high-performance computing, Google tends, to, Google tends to do quite well. Uh, the Microsoft Cloud, defined by its platform as a service, is a very rich set uh, of APIs that are available as, as part of the service, but more or less, more than anything else, has a tighter affinity to enterprise computing because of identity and security. And of course, the, the folks at AWS uh, can be largely credited with inventing uh, public cloud, riding on the back of the Zen hypervisor, by the way, which I worked on, um, and really being able to be able to bring all forms of, uh, of flexibility in terms of, of instances and cost uh, variety uh, faster than anybody else has really been able to do. And so you know, I'm sort of like not answering the question, well, which one will win? And I would say, well, which server vendor is one? And so people would choose a server vendor for different reasons. Maybe you went with HP or Dell or, or Hitachi for, for various reasons. And I think we're going to see more of that happening. The good news is that all developers will benefit from it as these big three and others as well keep innovating and providing more and more services, more specialized services for developers to build their applications more inexpensively uh, and in a way that just couldn't be enabled anywhere else. Jill? Uh, I concur with Frank. I think that we are early in this game, and it's nice to see you all in the room because this is a game that is 
fundamentally changing how computing happens. The cloud is the new operating system. It is a three horse race. Two of those horses are from Seattle. It's lovely to see that from, from an ecosystem perspective here. I think there's a lot more that will happen in the Seattle ecosystem because of the cloud residence that's here. Obviously, you have Amazon with just incredible speed, technical supremacy, and just an, an insane passion to really bring new services on board. I mean, it's the speed is amazing. Microsoft is doing the same thing. I, I always say to people, um, there's, there's two companies or two, two entities in the world that we don't want to compete with. One is called Guthrie, the other is called Jassy. And uh, the, the Microsoft Azure progress has been just tremendous. They have an incredible, um, real link into the business relationships that that company's had for years, being able to deploy both on-premise and in the cloud and have the, the sort of the wrapper around those business relationships. Google is not to be counted out in any way. They have an incredible um, presence from a data and infrastructure. They've contributed in an amazing way to some of the open source projects that we see changing things. And I will, I will not suck up to the moderator, but if you read the last uh, Platformonomics blog post around the infrastructure spend of these players, the CapEx spend, it, it is a really important point to think about just the billions of dollars that are going into the platforms that are delivering this public cloud internet out to developers, to enterprises, to industry. We actually do a lot of work in the manufacturing and industrial sectors, and you're seeing those sectors with their massive amounts of data really care about their cloud strategies for the first time. But to build a public cloud is not cheap and you need an underlying asset that can bring that to you, whether it's Amazon's retail business, uh, Microsoft's server business, but also Office 365, whether it's Google's search business, and the billions of dollars that are going into that, uh, to, to, quote, to quote Charles, frankly, last year, you had over $30 billion of infrastructure spend from those three cloud players. So I think we'll have a three horse race for a long time, and I think it will be very exciting, not just for developers, also for Seattle. As long as you're pandering, do you want to do you want to continue or I don't. Okay, all right, <laughs> Soma. So sure. Amazon run away with it or sure. On, on the one hand, like you know, it's been sort of uh, ten years or a little over ten years since Amazon came out and uh, you know, talked about cloud computing and like you know the first uh, sort of story that they talked about EC2 and S3, right? So it's been ten years in the making. On the other hand, for all the hoopla, for all the noise, for all the innovation, for all the goodness that has happened. I would say we are still in the very early stages of adoption, particularly if you look at the business world kind of thing, right? Uh, you talk to any enterprise uh, company or a CIO, you would hear anything ranging from like you know 5% of their uh, workloads to 30, 40% of their workloads uh, migrating to the cloud, and there's still a lot more work that needs to happen, right? Uh, and, and people have talked about the, the market size, so to speak, for this world to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, if not more, right? When you have such a huge market opportunity, the world has room for more than one player to, to have a meaningful presence, to have a meaningful share kind of thing, right? Uh, I think Sheila said this rightly. I think Microsoft is coming from a, you know, hey, I have the relationship, I have the connection with enterprise customer, I'm gonna build on that, and I'm making fast progress with my public cloud. I think Amazon, by virtue of being the first more advantage, has got a tremendous presence today, and they're gonna continue doing that. I think Google, in, in fact, I would say that like you know, I've been a little, uh, and it's easy always to say it from the outside, but I would say I've been a little underwhelmed at the rate of progress that I've seen them make, uh, particularly among enterprise customers. But like Sheila says, I don't think we can count them out. I think they have some fantastic technology, and hopefully they'll be a more meaningful player in the cloud market in years to come. Great. So we heard some numbers this morning, low tens of billions for direct cloud infrastructure spend. If you toss SaaS and sort of everything around it in, you get to a couple hundred billion. Annual IT spend is, is on the order of 2.5 trillion. How much of that do we think gets eaten by cloud and, and how fast? All right, should we move on to the next okay, question? Well. No, I mean, quite a bit, right? So you start with IAS and you sort of take each of the layers of the traditional IT spend, right? You map that out. And what we're seeing is you just keep eating up the stack, right? The cloud revenue is just eating different layers of the stack. 
I had the SQL Server business at Microsoft historically, right? Databases were the largest profit pool in enterprise computing. You see now the cloud vendors really coming out with services that replace a lot of those traditional massive, massive businesses. There's still a lot of stickiness to them, but frankly, we are watching them continue to eat up the stack. And as venture capitalists, it's important that we think of everything we do in the context of let's make sure we understand how this works vis-a-vis -vis AWS, Azure, GCE, just like people used to think, let me understand how does this work vis-a-vis -vis Windows, right? Am I part of the ecosystem? Am I competing against that stack? And, and just being smart about thinking, you know, we can put a certain amount of money into companies. Well, those behemoths can put billions of dollars into their initiatives and efforts. We don't want to be caught in the competitive crossfire. Now, concurrent with that, there's a lot of areas where we will just ride on top of innovations in these, in these areas. So we, we invested in a security company in Denver called ProtectWise, which is it's resident on top of AWS, and it secures data kind of for cloud native companies. Their first customer was Netflix. And so understanding that information, we have a lot of visibility into it. But now we're winning the large energy players who actually don't have a lot of the data that we're protecting in the cloud, but we're using the cloud to protect their data. So you have cloud native, cloud born, as well as other companies taking advantage of that. And you'll see that convergence happen more over time. But I think the answer is it's a large, large uh, percentage and growing. So if, if we look at it from a customer perspective and, and of that, two and a half trillion, probably 80% of that gets spent by the big enterprises. If I'm a big enterprise, I make the decision I'm gonna go cloud. How fast can I, can I actually make that happen? Where do I start? Do we believe that hybrid, multi-cloud are, are significant parts of that strategy or are people gonna go all in on a single cloud? Yeah. I'll, I'll give it a shot here. So um, I think now that, again, the again, public cloud uh, now that it's, it has become a trusted infrastructure as opposed, again, to the technical, technical curiosity, they will see kind of a similar pattern that we saw uh, around, again, this is more mainstream. Now, this is not if you're a SaaS company building your application on public cloud, that's different. We're talking enterprise IT, companies that actually make money and have, uh, don't, don't necessarily make money from software, but it's part of the, the tax of being in business, which is a very large, a very large tax. If we think back to the late 90s, uh, when hypervisors first came into existence, uh, primarily VMware, Zen Hypervisor, and Hyper-V, what happened was you saw a lot of, let's just say, lighter duty, older workloads being moved into virtual machines, and then virtual machines being collected on banks of servers for cost efficiency. And cost efficiency had really nothing to do with performance or anything like that, but just the fact you can do more with less, less hardware, you have some software, and you can run more apps. And so one of the first orders of business will be for enterprises, businesses of all sizes, to identify existing on-premises applications that are candidates to make that move. So people call this lift and shift, or you can call it modernization, whatever. And there are a number of implications around that, around networking and gravity of data. But I think more and more, now that so many client-server applications have come into existence because of virtualization and even running physically, over the course of the past 20 years, there's a large body of those things to begin movement. That'll be the first thing, the first thing to go. And also, uh, as a result of older operating systems coming off of support, uh, and this is actually happening in our lifetimes now, we're like, wow, you know, it was like 14 years ago, right? This thing served 2003. Well, now that's coming off support, so folks want to get those apps uh, up to cloud. And we're, there's a set of technologies now that are finally in play to make that cost efficient so there's not as much labor. So you'll see more and more companies containerizing, dockerizing their applications and moving them to one or more public clouds. The, now the, uh, the company that's moving the apps doesn't need to really have a, a deep, deep understanding of the target cloud. They can go to a cloud that, that actually makes sense for them. So we're having more and more tech now coming into play to allow us you know, to make that move. And that, as Sheila did say, that will, you know, that will accelerate. Any thoughts on hybrid, multi-cloud? Is that real, or are people going to make one big bet? Yeah, I, from my, my opinion, it's, it's I mean, I, I guess I wrote, I wrote a blog article, I don't know, about six years ago, and you say, you know, public, private, hybrid, the answer is yes. And, you know, for, for large enterprise, it is largely going to be hybrid and, in fact, multi, uh, multi-cloud. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of large companies now um, stating to their, uh, to their suppliers that they must run multi-cloud. Uh, but hybrid cloud is, is definitely going to be there. The challenge with hybrid cloud in the past uh, has been the lack of really great networking support to get applications that you're writing for a public cloud to access your existing 
pieces of applications or data that are left behind that may in fact never move or may be a long time in coming. Uh, and so, you know, we see a lot of surveys, most CIOs and other folks that care about this stuff within the, let's just say the top 8,000 buyers of technology are stating that a, a hybrid strategy is the one that's gonna make the most sense to them. Soma? So I would say for at least the next 10, 20, 30 years, hybrid load is gonna be around, right? Uh, a, because like not, not everybody is gonna be able to move everything that they have on-premises to the public cloud overnight. It's gonna take time. By default, like they're gonna be in a sort of this mixed mode environment for a long time to come. I think people also need to take the time to get uh, comfortable, to get to feel like you know, hey, the right levels of security and data protection and all the other things that they care about in a public cloud world that they feel that the technology providers or the public cloud providers are really delivering on that, and that's going to take time for them to get the level of trust. And then even then, like, you know, there's going to be some uh, what I call extreme situations, whether it is government-related or you know, some uh, you know, specific industry-related stuff, where they will want some stuff on their uh, on-premises environment for a long time to come. So I think hybrid is so, sort of like you know, how I think the world is going to be operating at least for the next two to three decades, right? Multi-cloud, it, to me, like, you know, it's no different than what enterprises have been doing all along. If you look at the last 10, 20 years, right, you know, as people think about deploying servers on-premise, they always say, like, you know, hey, we need to have a multi-platform environment, right? You know, Windows and uh, Linux or Windows, Unix, whatever the, the platform of choice for the day is. But enterprises have always believed that like, they didn't want to be locked in with any one particular technology vendor. And I think that, that sentiment, that sort of... Uh, activity is going to continue even as people move to the cloud. Already, like you know, a lot of people are talking about, uh, hey, I want to be in a multi-cloud environment. The reality, though, is you know, a particular workload usually is going to stay on one cloud. It's not like I'm going to take the same workload and keep running it in multiple clouds kind of thing. There's just a bunch of problems there. But do I run all of my workloads with the same cloud or on the same cloud, or do I say, like, you know, hey, maybe for these workloads I take a bet here, for these I take a bet there? I think that's going to be more the norm that you're going to see in enterprises. Okay. Well, let's talk about investing. Um, that's what you guys normally are doing all day. Where are the opportunities in cloud? I assume you're not funding a lot of infrastructure as a service startup. So where's the opportunity now from a VC perspective? Uh, so I would, I would actually say, like, hey, cloud infrastructure, there's still a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, companies to start up for us to be able to invest kind of thing, right? In fact, I would say if I look at the last six to 12 months that we as a firm have been investing in, there's a fair amount of what I call cloud native, you know, next generation cloud infrastructure related startups, right? Whether it is thinking about like serverless computing or whether it's still thinking about like containers and what can I do in a world of containers and like, you know, even driven functions and microservices architecture, there's just a, a bunch of things that I think, you know, people can go solve in a, in a startup environment, and we've had a, a number of companies that we've invested in in the last six, nine months there, right? Mm -hmm. But then as you move up the stack, I think there is still a lot of value that people can think about delivering at the application level, particularly sort of we get excited about what we call intelligent applications, right? Where you think about like, you know, hey, not just like, you know, predictable uh, uh, you know, behavior from an application, but really go learn from the data that you have access to, go learn from that and sort of continuously learn and in the process do a better job for your customers. We see a lot of uh, enterprise use cases that are possible and startups are doing even as we speak here. Yeah, I, I agree with Soma. I think that a lot of the opportunity for venture capitalists these days is up stack as you take advantage of the incredibly rich platform elements and the ability to develop and deploy more seamlessly, more easily, but also that the, the real benefit that the cloud gives you vis-a-vis -vis that data ownership, that data predictability, that comparability between your different companies, because we're running all of that data in a cloud and we're then able to do very business appropriate, business useful comparisons, it, it's incredibly invaluable. Our last investment um, was in the insurance software space. And so it's specific to a vertical, adding value. You have the industry incumbents really betting on this company in order to take forward the, the, the learnings and the benefit of cloud, mobile, um, data-centric computing for their industry. We also like serverless. Right. And so one of the things that, uh, that we look at you know, relative to cloud is that we look at applications that could not exist were it not for what cloud brings from an application perspective. 
And those things may include a very low cost access to things like cognitive services, low cost access to elastic compute, elastic storage, networking, availability, all of these things that to build them on premises that would just be too expensive to even go after. And so if you just think about the applications are really across the board from, from things that are as you know, mundane as, as large scale, large scale database servers, which looks like look like things that would have been implemented you know, on premises, but just with, with much greater much greater scale capacity, all the way now to to kind of things like risk models and analysis that can run many times in a day because you can just go scale out that compute as opposed to in the past where you would have had to sink all of the cost on premises in order to size every run uh, of those things. And so it really is across the board in, in, in terms of that sort of flexibility and enablement. And again, so enablement is always, always, a, big, uh, always a big word for us. Uh, the other thing uh, about, uh, again, about the cloud is with, with the last presenter up here um, actually was talking about uh, Resin, talking about the edge as emerging as a, uh, as a third platform that is, let's just say, kind of tethered uh, to the cloud, but, uh, but not necessarily reliant on it. Uh, for all of its decision making, and in, in effect, it'll become something that is a something that feeds the fire of what you can do on the back end uh, of a public or or private cloud with with extraordinary new sets of of application scenarios that also just would have not been that would have been possible in the past. So, for, from an edge perspective, I mean that's certainly a hot buzzword. I mean, you're really saying the programming model and the architecture of the cloud is going to expand out to the edge, or? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so again, I'm, I'm you know, both. You know, someone and I worked on operating systems, so we'll have we'll have some strong opinions, uh, you know, in this space. And you know, 10 years ago, we would have never thought about you know, this, you know, such a thing, you know, like large scale operating systems running on these little on these little tiny devices. But again, what the what the resident folks were talking about is the ability to actually push containerized apps from really around any place uh, at all. And so one can envision, you know, application and data being kind of mated together as the, as that processing flows naturally between an edge system, which could be a, an array of, of sensors, or large systems like disk drives, uh, all the way back, and then those, and those applications can flow seamlessly back to, uh, back to a, cl uh, a cloud computing scenario uh, for further processing. And all, all that being said, there's a set of development, software development tooling, systems management, security, storage architectures, databases that need to be developed in order to support all of that. And so yet there again lies a big piece of opportunity. And uh, you know, Soma was, uh, uh, was alluding to some of those things in, in his comments as well. But these things will, will definitely span. But at the lower levels are the availability of CPU, memory, and networking that just would not have been possible in the past combined with the, with the movement around containerization will, uh, will, will drive innovation there like we haven't seen before. So Moore's Law is still a thing. Uh, well, so we have Moore's Law and also the other laws we have around networking and also yeah. speed of memory access. Speed of memory access, again, a very mundane topic. It's something that's you know, whispered still largely in, in places like Hillsborough, Oregon, and, uh, and Redmond uh, as, a, as, a, a critical, uh, as a critical thing in order to enable these scenarios. Cool. Well, let's talk about business models. So the, the cliche is software is eating the world. Open source is eating software. Cloud is eating open source. Crypto tokens may, may be the next thing that goes and eats the cloud. I mean, it's, it's the technology's one consideration when you're making an investment. What, what kind of business models are you looking for today? What do you think are most, most defensible? Now, ones that make money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that there's, so generally speaking, we really do look for traditional SaaS, I say traditional SaaS, even though SaaS has, hasn't, hasn't been around that long, but SaaS plus data business models. We are looking at tokenization. We are looking at the crypto phenomena, not as much as a just, hey, that's a fintech innovation, but as a way that large software projects can be developed, can be monetizable by individual developers, can culturally actually let the best code float up to the surface, can create systems of working together at scale that are global in nature, you have development happening everywhere, and that, can, that people can get paid from. And that, that's really important and really interesting. Now, we have not done a deal with that business model, but we look at where software developers can monetize and can make money. We think about how that plays with cloud services and with open source um, innovations, platforms, programs, 
And frankly, it also plays in a world of, in a lot of cases, way less venture capital. So that's always interesting to think about what's, you know, we, way, we talk way about- Way less to the point of none in some To cases, the point of right? none, yeah. What, what's obsoleting X? Okay, well this, what's obsoleting you? Potentially tokenization and cryptocurrency models. And we think that that phenomena is important, interesting, and frankly, probably good for the development ecosystem kind of as a collective, as a whole, haven't figured out that translation into investments, into business models that work and that make money. Like, like Frank said, we're very interested in software companies that do deliver profits, that do deliver real, you know, both top line and bottom line results. And software businesses are just magic at the end of the day, right? They scale magically. They're beautiful. They're, I would say they're the most beautiful business models. Well, they're, they're continuing to change and evolve, and I think that's really exciting. I think one of the things that I want to sort of highlight about business models here is as much as the last 10 years there's been a, a massive movement towards sort of software subscriptions as opposed to licensing, I do think, I do wonder whether we are running into a situation where people are fatigued or tired of like you know, all the subscriptions that they have to manage, right? One of, the, one of our portfolio companies that's been around for about three, four years recently decided to just check like, you know, how they are spending their money and like, how many subscriptions they have. They literally have like, you know, a couple hundred different subscriptions that some, you know, either an employee or somebody in the company has decided that it's interesting that they want to pay. And so there is this massive amount of you know, subscription economy that these companies are dealing with, right? And this is a company that's three years old kind of thing, and let alone all the enterprises and the commercial ventures. So one thing that I think, you know, even in, inside the subscription model, as people start thinking about, like, you know, hey, what their business model should look like, I do wonder whether it should be a, a standard subscription irrespective of what you use or not use kind of thing, or whether it should be like, you know, hey, the, the offering itself is for free, but then depending on usage, you can decide how to monetize kind of thing. I feel like, you know, people have to think more uh, holistically and differently about that because on the one hand, subscription seems like the way to go. On the other hand, I start hearing from companies that like, oh my God, I got all these subscriptions, I don't know how to manage, I don't want to really sign up for more subscriptions kind of thing, right? Having said that, I do agree with you know, Sheila's comment and Frank's comment about like, you know, you really have to figure out like, you know, any business model where the individual developer can get excited about because like, you know, hey, they know how they can deliver value and they know how they can monetize value, I think is the one that's going to stay for a long, long time uh, to come. And, and, and like, you know, maybe this is sort of, you know, I don't know if this is a, a Seattle thing or not, but, but the three of us here are VCs, we love companies who make money, who are profitable sooner than later kind of thing, right? It's a that novel just, thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's just good fundamentals. It's crazy. And, uh, and there are times, there are places where, like, you know, hey, you really want to sort of, you know, do things to grow your share or, uh, you know, usage or adoption. Uh, and, and balance it with revenues, but we love businesses that are making money and they, that are sort of you know, thinking about profitability as a core part of their uh, strategy. Right, right. And I'll just got a comment because since Charles mentioned uh, you know, open source, and you know, I, I do have the, the personal benefit of working at both the cathe working on cathedral projects uh, at Microsoft and, uh, and IBM and places like that before uh, before Microsoft, and then being part of the bazaar when I was at uh, when I was at ZenSource. Uh, and there's, there's, if any of you haven't actually read the small book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, it's a worthwhile short read on a cross-country flight. And uh, where sort of the, the open source business model was defined. And open, people became confused about open source over the years. Open source became uh, synonymous with, with free. And, and yeah, you can, as a developer or a company, you can open source your stuff and therefore, yea, verily, it is free. What we found is that there are, there is, there's, there are very, very strong uh, open source businesses that are, uh, we can look to the past and, we, and we'll also see them, see them in the future. But uh, an open source business has to have certain characteristics around that. In particular, one is where a company like an enterprise is willing to pay for the relationship to ensure that they can actually bet their business on that stuff. And so open source just isn't like something that's a couple of hundred lines of code sitting out on GitHub and you go use it and you may not ever you know, pay for that. But the large projects that do provide real value are still going to cause accretive revenues to the, to the maintainers of those projects as, as they become companies. Now people can say, well, the big three clouds, it can go adopt that. I will challenge you, there is no historical precedent. There is no historical precedent for a commercially successful open source project to be consumed 
and co-opted, again, a commercially successful existing open source company to be completely consumed and co-opted. If you look at the large majority of the open source companies today, the bulk of those subscription revenues still accrete to the places where the project maintainers and creators reside. And that, and that has been the hallmark of open source in, in the past. Now, we do face a situation now as we move from the bazaar, which is the way you kind of went and built software, to I'll call it the Costco of, uh, of computing, where in the past in the bazaar, you had to really know who to go talk to, how to grab projects and build businesses out of that. Um, and now with the, with the emergence of, of containers and things like GitHub and the Docker store, now you can go and actually find things much more easily. And all of those things will install. You'll pay for that, pay for them. They're certified, they're managed, and they're rated in ways that they weren't, that they weren't in the past. So yet again, we'll see an emergence of, a, I think, of a new business model there as well. Uh, that'll be relevant for many of us. Cool. So AI, I know you're inundated with AI companies. How do you sort of separate the wheat from the chaff and decide who's real? And what are you looking for to turn that technology into a, into a business? We've avoided doing anything that's just horizontal AI for AI's sake. And people talk about AI companies sort of comma, then they talk about software companies. There really aren't software companies that aren't software and AI companies anymore. And if you think about both where software companies have had to pull analytics, um, machine learning, or AI into their ecosystem, into their development environment, that, that's one thing. But most software companies that are born today have inherently decided that AI is an advantage, inherently decided that data science and integrating AI into the company from the beginning is an important element. And what we like is uh, then, therefore, we like applied software, we like applied AI, where you're solving a specific business problem. You're not sort of saying, hey, we're creating a problem. We hope you're going to like this. We hope you want this. Where there's an identified buyer, there's an identified need, there's a pain point that we're serving that could be horizontal or vertical in nature, but we're actually very much using software and data to solve, to solve business problems. I would say, like, you know, I, I sort of... I hear you on the on where the value is today. I would say about three years ago, four years ago, probably there was an opportunity to say, hey, a horizontal AI platform still made sense for us to think about investing or you know being a part of kind of thing. But I think that ship has uh, sailed, at least in my opinion, right? Uh, I mean, there'll be a lot of aqua hires yeah, that continue. Sure, yeah. And then, and I'm sure there is like you know, hey, there are going to be some what I call niche places where like, you know, some technology innovation can happen still at the pla horizontal platform layer. But I think the, the humongous amount of value that is left to go capture is in the application layer, right? You talked, uh, Charles, you talked a lot about like, you know, hey, software is eating the world, open source is e eating software. I don't know if you uh, saw Jensen from NVIDIA talking about like, you know, how AI is eating, the, eating software now kind of thing, right? And we, I'll, we really- I'll get that one in next time. Sure, right. <laughs> Everything's eating everything. Right, but, but, but really like, you know, hey, I don't think anybody is building software today without thinking about like, you know, hey, how they can you know, apply some level of ML or DL or AI or something to sort of provide a much better experience today, right? So, so AI whenever, is, is a feature of everything. Yeah, but, but, so, but whenever we talk to startups, the thing that I, at least I look for is, you know, people can talk about like, you know, hey, which machine learning framework or deep learning framework they're using, which platform they're using, all the technology they can talk about, but I, but I also look for like, you know, what they say about data. Because I feel like you know, all the machine learning algorithms and models are all going to become more and more of a commodity. And it's really like the data in conjunction with a particular set of models that's going to differentiate what you can do versus what somebody else can do, right? So if, as long as the company is talking to us both about the algorithms and the data, then I think like, you know, it's an interesting conversation. If I see not enough conversation about data, then I start worrying about that. Cool. Let's, let's use our last few minutes and talk a little bit about Seattle as a tech, tech ecosystem. So I would say over the last couple of years, we've gotten kind of comfortable settling into this role as the little brother of, of the Bay Area. Do we think the, the dominance of Seattle in cloud changes that, that relationship at all? I, I sometimes joke that Seattle is, is Silicon Valley's landlord now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does change the game. I mean, I think it's, it's fine to call Seattle Silicon Valley's little sister, but it's not true, right? And everyone's moving up here. Everyone's opening an office up here. And I think the prevalence of, frankly, more cloud computing happening here than in any other city in the world does change the game. Yeah, I think so. Uh, 
if, if you look at, at the kind of, of movement, I think one of, one of the things that, you know, that people do notice is the, the amount of real estate leases that are being uh, taken by uh, mid-cap, large-cap, uh, even startups you know, from, from the Bay Area. And, and people forget, like, we've had you know, companies that moved here from the Bay Area you know, in the past. I mean, Tableau Soft Software was started uh, in California and, and moved, here, moved here early on. And there's, there is just a, a great, a great access to not just uh, software, software development talent, but people want to have, uh, they want to be close to, you know, to the epicenters and the thinkers uh, in, you know, in cloud computing. Uh, in, in addition, I think what you also find is, again, from as someone who actually travels back and forth to the Bay Area an awful lot, we're in a much more concentrate, concentrated geography here. So if you think about the greater Bay Area, Silicon Valley, as people like to say, it stretches from San Francisco down to south of San Jose. That's about 75 miles and many hours sitting in, sitting in a car. At an average speed of five miles speed, per hour. You can bicycle faster. Yeah. In fact, when I'm there, I don't even drive. You know, I, I get on the trains and buses and, and BART and, and all that good stuff. But you know, we are, we're concentrated, uh, and so there's, there's a, good, a, good promise, a good promise around that. And I think one of the other things, and again, this is a think, not, not know, at least it's an observation, is that what we find is for at least for high value software development talent, program management, uh, marketing functions, and things like that, people, people tend to stay in their jobs longer here. They don't go work someplace for two years and then go find the next, you know, find the next you know, hotly funded startup and go, and go move on to that. There tends to be more durability uh, of, of teams, and, it, and, and from my perspective, that's a, that's a super important team. And whether it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing or just because we don't have, we only have is, you know, one, one, you know, probably a 5% of the amount of companies that are created in a given year, it is something that's very attractive uh, to businesses of all sizes to kind of have that durability of team. So I think it's definitely changing, changing for the positive kind of thing. Uh, now, let me give you a couple of examples, right? Uh, last month, uh, I was at a dinner event that you know, somebody here put together, uh, inviting a whole bunch of VCs kind of thing. And I would say, like, you know, the who's who from the Silicon Valley VC ecosystem showed up here. And in fact, some of those guys were saying, like, you know, hey, I've never seen like, you know, so many Silicon Valley VCs come together in one uh, place. What's happening here, right? And, and, and it's sort of a testament to people getting excited about like, what is happening in Seattle and wanting to understand what is happening in Seattle and how they can be a part of that kind of thing. The other thing that, that, we are, that we've seen, at least in the last year, is there's been a tremendous amount of interest among, in, in, in terms of what is happening in Seattle and Seattle startups from the, from the Bay Area VCs and like, you know, literally like, you know, once a week or like, you know, sometimes a couple of times a week, we host people from there because they want to sort of come and understand the ecosystem here because they know something great is happening and they feel like, you know, oh my God, I'm not there, how do I participate more kind of thing. The other thing is, you know, it's, you know, as much as we can get excited and we should be excited about the fact that Seattle is the cloud capital of the world, it's not just like cloud computing, right? There are many other areas where I feel we have a tremendous amount of talent base and innovation that's happening here. Even things like, you know, VR and AR between what, like, you know, the bigger companies are doing and, the, and a whole bunch of startups here. I think we are, in my opinion, we are either number one or number two in a lot of what I call the hot technology trends as far as the footprint goes and the level of innovation goes. And all of these together, I think, make us, like, you know, just better and better every day that goes by. Cool. So one of the questions that always creates a lot of debate and self-flagellation in Seattle is whether there's enough venture capital in town. I won't ask you whether you, you think you need more competition, but <laughs> one argument is that we should just treat Seattle as, as an extension of the Bay Area. We're a suburb. I've even heard a, a VC who lives in the South Bay say it takes as long to get to Seattle as it does to San Francisco, the city. Um, the only difference is he doesn't get to go to the gym in the morning. Um, so does local VC money really matter? I mean, Soma Madrona is probably the most Seattle focused. I mean, is there a case for why Seattle companies should, should prefer Seattle VC money? So here, here's what I would say. We, I think every day, you know, in, in, just look at what has happened in the last year or two, right? You know, Sheila and Tola Capital are now in Seattle. I'm excited for that, right? Uh, in, in just in the last six months, you know, we've heard, we've seen a, a couple of uh, seed stage, early stage venture capital firms that are starting to take roots in Seattle, right? All of this is good. It is true that still, you know, when it comes to growth stage, we don't have a lot of money in Seattle to sort of feed the companies here. 
and we have to go look outside Seattle. And you know, but but I, I I sort of believe that like you know, hey, the ecosystem is there. There is a tremendous amount of innovation happening, and people are aware and cognizant of it. And money is going to flow in. Yes, I would love for you know money to be in Seattle already to be flowing in as opposed to coming from outside. But I think you know we'll get there. Cool. Well, with that, I, one, one of the things right. you see, though, right. uh, I, I agree with Soma, but you see Warburg doing probably more deals in Seattle than anywhere else. You see mm -hmm. Summit having just done Smartsheet. I mean, it's, it is happening now, and the city absolutely has the attention of the largest tech investors in the world. Cool. With that, we're out of time. Thanks to our panelists, and onward and upward to the cloud. Thank you.